All right, hi everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today for the new VEM webinar, How to Dramatically Improve Your AWS Cloud's Health. Um, we've got a really fantastic panel assembled here for you today, and um, at a high level, what we're going to be covering, or how we're going to be covering it rather, is we're going to do a quick round of introductions, and um, that'll take us, you know, probably in the neighborhood of about five minutes, and then we're going to transition into a kind of a free-form discussion around the topics at hand. Uh, that should take us anywhere in the neighborhood of, of 20 or 25 minutes. And, and then we're going to have kind of a, a structured Q&A uh, section of the webinar. And um, a couple things about that. So the conference line is on mute. So that means you're free to make, um, you know, free to make noise on your end that won't get transmitted to the webinar here. You won't be uh, interrupting anybody. Um, but we do certainly want your input. So you'll find a question panel on your GoToWebinar controls. Uh, they may be kind of collapsed. You may have to expand them out from the side of your screen. But you'll find a question panel there, and we would very much like uh, you to participate by uh, entering questions uh, that you'd like us to cover at the, the Q&A portion. And um, if you simply enter those into that questions uh, box, they'll, they'll appear here for me, and I'll get to those when we get to that section of the webinar. Last little bit of housekeeping is the webinar is being recorded. And uh, we will be reaching out to those who registered and participated with a link to that recording uh, sometime in the near future upon the conclusion of the webinar. With that said, let's get to introducing our fantastic panelists. Uh, first up, we have, uh, we have James Urquhart, who is the VP of uh, Product Strategy at Instratius. Uh, hi, thanks very much for uh, uh, inviting me to, to join the panel today. Um, my name is James Urquhart. I'm Vice President of Product Strategy for Instratius, uh, which is one of the leading companies in uh, the cloud management space for consumption of cloud services. Uh, we help uh, uh, enterprises consume infrastructure service capabilities from companies such as Amazon and, and over 20 other clouds and cloud platforms out there consistently with governance and security um, and uh, with automation uh, applied consistently. Uh, and I'm also author of, uh, uh, or a contributor to GigaOM, um, a frequent contributor talking about cloud computing and complex systems, and also a uh, former author of The Wisdom of Clouds on CNET, where uh, at one point in time I was uh, uh, named one of the top uh, most influential cloud bloggers as well. Fantastic. Thanks, James. Uh, next up we have uh, Jonathan, CTO of BuildFacts. Hey, thanks for having me as well. Um, I uh, I run uh, technology and product for uh, the only company that provides automated property condition information to insurance and lending. Um, but I also write uh, extensively for cloud computing for Information Week and Information Week reports and network computing. Thank you, Joe. And uh, last but of course not least, we have Harish Gannison, who's CTO and co-founder of 8K Miles. Hi, uh, I'm Harish Ganesan. I'm the co-founder and CTO of 8K Miles. Uh, we are an Amazon uh, premium partner. Uh, we typically help uh, companies onboard onto Amazon Cloud. Uh, we work on the retail, e-commerce, public sector, and the media industries. So we have, in the past, we have helped a lot of companies from startups to enterprises onboard onto Amazon. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, my name is Patrick Pusher. I'm moderator here today of this uh, this fantastic panel. And uh, I run a small consultancy here in Western Canada. And you can find uh, my work at cloudchronicle.com. So with that being said, let's get into sort of the meat and potatoes of our session today. Um, what we have really first up to talk about is is um, optimal cloud utilization. And, and, and what that means for us in, in, in our context of our discussion today is you know, we're, we're pretty used to, in the traditional data center model, we're pretty used to being able to um, outfit with enough infrastructure to meet the, you know, our, our service delivery guidelines. The cloud, though, represents kind of a unique opportunity on the other side as well to, to ensure that we're being very, very efficient with our use of resources, even, even in periods when, you know, our, our, our service um, our service delivery may, you know, may have been flow a little bit, right? So it's not only you know, the least common denominator, right, that the, the infrastructure we need to, 
to um, to host our services at the at the most peak times, but also how to scale back and and be very very efficient in our utilization um, at, at, in in those valleys as well. So so my question maybe then is to to start the the conversation. Or what are some of the ways we can achieve that balance? What are some of the you know are there new methodologies? Are there new, are there new tools? Is it, is it a process question? How do we achieve that that optimal utilization? And maybe I'll go to to you first, Joe. Thanks. Um, uh, I think the the three key tips that I would give uh, for any cloud planning and cloud optimization are first to understand what it is that you're paying for when you use a particular public cloud or private cloud uh, solution. In other words, when you're paying Amazon Web Services, you're paying them for the security that they provide, uh, physical security, you're providing, the, you're getting the 24-hour monitoring, you're getting really high-grade hardware um, and staff. Uh, and in some cases, you may not need all of that for, let's say, internally facing applications. So just be aware of all of the costs that are baked into particular providers and some of the cost discounts you get from the economies of scale. The second uh, tip I would give is that you need to be using configuration management and backup and restore management. Uh, the, the flexibility of the cloud is around scaling your applications and your workloads to the times that they're needed and the times that they aren't needed. Um, and if you don't have a really efficient way to take a server and uh, take a workload that's on a server and put it on a smaller server or take it down for a little while and bring it back up or scale it massively uh, to hundreds of servers, then it doesn't matter what else you do, you're just not equipped to take advantage of the cloud. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third tip I have is that if you're not measuring and tracking your usage on the cloud, if you're not uh, taking account of how of the individual server utilization as well as all the costs you're outlaying on the cloud very closely, uh, you're likely not going to be using the cloud in, in an optimal way. And I'll, I'll uh, yeah, add to that. Absolutely. Bit. And um, this is James. Uh, sure. Yes, please go ahead. Sure, go ahead. So I, I think the the, the, I think one of the key things um, to remember is, is sort of uh, you know along that lines of, of of measuring and then being able to take action on what you measure, and that's sort of a combination, a little bit of, of the config management point that Joe brought up, as well as um, uh, as well as the the, the measurement point. Um, one of the key things that we see in terms of, of really beginning to optimize uh, the utilization of cloud is um, to really begin to take advantage of. Um, of automation in, a, in, in many different levels. So there's many granularities of automation that you have to take a look at um, to really be able to kind of tune what's going on. So first of all, at the instance level, right, being able to build an instance on the right size, uh, being able to scale that correctly, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, but also then looking at the application as a whole, does it make more sense for the application to be deployed in a single region, a single availability zone, um, or maybe you want to go multi-region with your deployment, or maybe even potentially want to go multi-cloud so that you've got some backups. There's, there's some really good, consistent alternatives, not in terms of the, uh, deployment uh, portability, but in terms of operational capability. Um, clouds out there that, that are alternatives that you can use for you know, secondary sites for uh, running applications, and it's beginning to be, be more realistic to think about having a mission-critical application running multi-cloud. And all that being said, you begin to then look at things like, um, you know, with the applications you have, does it scale well horizontally? Um, and how would you do that? And when would you do that? Well, when you do that is dependent on um, consistent measurement and an understanding over time of the most cost-effective times to scale and the right signals to use to determine the scaling. An uh, example I'll give of that is Netflix used to scale based on CPU loads and I.O. loads and those kinds of things, and they don't anymore. They scale based on demand for specific movies um, from specific areas. And because of the way their servers are laid out, they will scale out different um, groups of servers based on that demand. Um, the rumor has been for a long time that uh, there are several financial services companies now that scale their systems based on uh, market conditions as opposed to uh, technology conditions. Right. Um, and so then the next question is, is you know, if you can scale horizontally, um, if you can't scale horizontally, can you scale vertically? And that would mean bringing up replacement instances um, that are maybe a little bit larger instance types as a way of scaling, so that you're not uh, you're not uh, increasing the parallel demand on your system, but you're increasing 
uh, the amount of compute capacity available, and you're scaling that back down to save costs again later. Um, again, that still requires the application to be able to um, to fail over between instances pretty easily. But it's it's an option that's out there for some applications that um, aren't really built for parallel, as well as they're built for for failover conditions. Um, but all of that requires measurement. All of that requires the ability to to have a really good picture of what's going on. And so I think you know a lot of it comes down to the three tips are really you know measure well, automate well, and then uh, adapt. Um, adapt to what you see over time. Yeah, and that's a that's a great sort of segue into. So you talk, you, you know, you gave a few um, Netflix examples, which is a great example, sort of the poster child for, for AWS, certainly. Um, but then when we when we shift maybe to more of an enterprise IT um, potential use case, where you may have, you know, different business units consuming cloud resources in different ways, even from the same provider. I mean, you gave, you gave the example of multi-cloud being a little more realistic, and I certainly agree with you. But even if we constrain the, the conversation to, to AWS, um, you know, if we have several business units using the cloud in different ways, consuming in different ways, how do we, or do we, maybe that's the, the more basic question, um, is it prudent to take sort of that top-down view of all of those efforts, um, you know, for the, for the sake of, you know, are we being efficient, are we consuming properly, or do we have to go kind of into these siloed efforts and, and um, you know, look, look more closely at how we're consuming resources, or is it a combination thereof? Well, I think, you know, this is the really interesting thing that's happening, right? Uh, if you look at the Internet as a whole, um, you could make the argument, and I would love to see somebody who's got really so solid research skills either prove or disprove this, but my belief is that if you take any two applications that are connected to the Internet, that are dependent in some way on the Internet, either for connectivity to data or because they're web services or whatever, um, that you can, within six degrees of separation, both in terms of uh, um, integrations and or the shared technologies that are being used, connect any two of those elements that are connected together. So you have you know six degrees of separation between any two uh, software components that are connected to the internet. And I think um, I think within an enterprise that's very true too. You have you know this incredible chain of systems that are interconnected from one way to another uh, in in what they do. And I think because of that, and because you have many, many different teams and many, many different individuals, you have and this human scale problem of of all the different um, uh, all the different developers and operation staff and so on that are, inter are are interoperating with these things. You have a what's you know a complex systems problem, and if you if you you know study complex systems at all and the, the science behind that, now you begin to realize you have many, many agents um, that have are each have their own rule sets and are each making their own independent decisions. Um, or have people making those decisions for them that are connected together in a chain where there's an emergent behavior for the system as whole. Well. And I think that the only logical way to deal with that situation is to understand that you can only affect the behavior of the individual elements. You can only change the automation you have around your application deployments or the automation that you have around or the measurement that you're measuring at for each application. But you need to begin to tie that into a visibility into what's going on and understanding of the feedback loops that get created and the dependencies that get created within the system um, through the, those measurements to get that vis you know to use a tool or, or set of tools that give you really clear visibility into the costs and the operational parameters of the system as a whole um, as a way to influence the decisions that you make then for each application moving forward it may turn out that you have an application that's um, what my friend Dave McCorry likes to call a super node, right? It's a, it's a critical application that many, many other applications depend on, or a data set that fits that description. And so you may want to make decisions about how you further develop that data set or that application based on the feedback you get for the system as a whole. And I think, so I think that's, you know, it's really, this is the, the age we're moving into is where you don't have siloed concerns anymore. Everybody's a part of the same picture. Everybody's a part of the same puzzle. And so operations needs to develop the skill set to look not only at the individual pieces, but to look at the puzzle as a whole, to look at the system as a whole. Right, certainly having, you know, it's, it's really a combination of, of the micro expertise you need on, on, a, on a service or app level. And then, as you mentioned, it's kind of that, that overarching, you know, top down, am I, am I using resources as efficiently as possible? You know, do I have the right instance types? And, and am I load balancing correctly? Kind of on a, yeah, on, on, a, on a bigger kind of organizational level, perhaps. Um, 
So as we think about quality of service, as we think about service level agreements to your end user, um, how do you achieve the balance in creating something that's meaningful to your customer, that, that, that um, provides value, yet is affordable from a service delivery perspective um, to your organization, right? So in there, of course, there's, you know, there's high availability. There's lots of kind of micro concepts in that question, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll go to you first, um, uh, Harish. And, you know, what's the balance? How, how does an organization kind of approach this problem? Uh, see what I've seen. Like first, uh, I'd like to uh, tell about the optimal cloud utilization because I just wanted to come in, but uh, sure. got into the second one. Uh, what what I've seen in terms of the optimal cloud utilization is like understanding the constraints, intricacies, and advantages, uh, and you have to get your architecture right for leveraging the cloud, and you have to automate and monitor your utilization is what the three tips that I want to tell. And now coming to this uh, uh, SLA part, uh, uh, typically we have, I've seen like uh, certain times uh, the uh, AWS, sorry, the SLA that is there on the AWS, uh, certain services that they give is uh, okay. And uh, certain times, uh, it has to be like uh, the companies like us, the service providers, we build like a lot of uh, managed services over that. And uh, we uh, uh, do a lot of work in terms of keeping the SLA. And uh, this is what I feel in terms of the SLA aspect of uh, AWS. Yeah, and I think, you know, so there's the SLA aspect to to your cloud. Um, in, in this case, you know AWS. There's there's the SLA they provide, but then also the SLA you in turn provide, um, you know, against your services. And if it's a if it's a consumer level service, maybe this isn't isn't as uh, you know kind of a, a bit of a foreign concept. But you know, when you have to provide an SLA to your customer, and you're depending on your infrastructure as a service provider, of course. Um, there's a there's a lot of strategy there, right? There's a lot of strategy on on how you remain up, how you remain available, um, and, and of course, there's a cost balance question. So, you know, I guess what I'm looking for is, you know, what are some of the tactics? What are some of the strategies? Um, how do you even start to think about what your SLA looks like? I mean, are there is that a business question? Is that a technical question in your eyes? Uh, okay, certain times, see, uh, what we do typically because it's a virtualized environment. Uh, we kind of uh, go with this uh, design for failure uh, methodology and we kind of uh, um, uh, design the applications, the architecture in such a way that there is high availability built. So uh, the, uh, the app servers or your web servers are spread across multiple availability zones. Your database servers have uh, proper replication and slaves uh, and they spread across the availability zones. And when we build these kind of uh, architectures uh, on these uh, cloud, so what happens is like your high availability and those portions are taken care of. So even if like one of your uh, instances uh, are not reacting, there are the other instances which are like acting and which are able to support and uh, help uh, keep the website up. So in that way, we kind of uh, mitigate the, the risk and another thing is like uh, once you are going with multiple uh, servers and multiple EC2 instances running across uh, availability zones, naturally like it is going to be a little expensive than running in single uh, AZ uh, with the single set of servers. But uh, overall if you see, uh, it brings about a balance, it bring, brings about uh, stability uh, into your overall website uh, running and your application level. So that's what we usually recommend and that's what we do to our customers. And, and that's a great point. I mean, I wonder, to, to be able to guarantee an SLA, do you need an application, for lack of a better term, that is cloud aware, that can scale horizontally very gracefully? Or is there an opportunity? Are there tools or are there you know, best practices? Even for, you know, James mentioned applications that are a little bit stubborn in how they scale earlier. 
um, and maybe I'll point this question to you, James. Is there an opportunity to, you know, guarantee a, a quality or a, of, of, of service for applications like that, or are we really talking about, you know, um, cloud purpose, cloud build applications? Well, so so this is the this is always the fun when you talk about SLAs and cloud, right? Because um, uh, the benefits that those that are using cloud well to to you know build whole new levels of availability in their applications come not from the cloud providing that, but from their applications being able to take advantage of the services that are available and provide that reliability themselves. So one of the big questions that has to be asked um, in this in this area is, um, you know. Uh, what do we want from uh, SLAs? You know, what what are the purposes of SLAs? And I think my argument would go that that we need better SLAs for some classes of applications, some classes of enterprise. What what SLA really means in this context to me, though, is not uh, this is not an assurance that I will never have to worry about systems going down. Therefore, I can I can you know not not write to those problems. I cannot you know I can avoid those in my development. I can ignore you know assume that my system will never go down. It's, it's to make sure that we have an agreement with the vendor about the level of competency that's being delivered by the underlying infrastructure, that, that we know the amount of effort and the amount of attention being paid to core availability concerns, performance concerns, which are very important and often lost. Mm -hmm. um, and so these SLAs become really, really important Less so to sort of say, okay, cool, I don't have to worry about that because my vendor is going to worry about that. And much more so to say, you know, uh, the, every single failure is a potential risk to bring everything else down, no matter how good a developer I am. So what I want is the, I'm willing to pay for the level of service that you know, guarantees the least amount of failure in the system, even though I'm going to continue to build, assuming that the system will fail at some point in time. And that's really the way, that, if you look at it from that perspective, then these SLAs are incredibly valuable. I think there are a number of businesses out there that would love to be able to say, even though I realize, you know, to, in order to be able to take advantage of this, I have to develop resiliency in my software. Mm -hmm. You know, I really want that five nines anyway because I don't want to have a dependency on the software. Um, you know, 100% on the software being there, uh, able to recover from every single failure occurs. So I still want failure um, rates to be rare, uh, even though I'll develop to it. I think the mistake would be to look at SLA in the way I was saying, you know, the alternative way, which is to say. You know, I want my developer, I want my uh, provider to provide me with five nines because, um, you know, my app, my, I'm not going to write applications that can handle failure. I'm going to, I just want to write applications that assume that the hardware is going to work. Because I think if you do that, the problem you're going to run into is, again, with all these interconnected elements of the way the cloud works, there are cascading failure situations within services, as we've seen in AWS a few times, not their fault and not in any way sort of ripping on them. Mm -hmm. um, these things happen in, a, in an environment such as theirs, um, and they will happen again. And you know, and, by the way, Azure's seen this a number of times, and Google's sure. not public yet, and they've seen it in their beta already. Mm -hmm. These things are going to happen. And so, what you want, you know, I think there's a great opportunity for um, for increased SLA capability. But but I think even as important, management of those SLAs. So. Understand if you can understand the failure rate of the cloud elements you're using, you can make different decisions without having to enter into an explicit agreement about what you consume in order to get the best availability you can have. And then if you can negotiate those explicit agreements furthermore, um, I think then you get uh, you know a really interesting situation for your most critical applications where you want the least risk of failure in the system possible. Um, and in those situations, you may pay a lot more than somebody who doesn't um, adjust for those scenarios. But um, but ultimately, if that's what your objective is, is if that's the best balance of uh, risk to reward, then you can take advantage of that. And then there's a great opportunity if you can actually measure, you know, against different cloud services, different capabilities to measure the SLAs are being met, to then you know to, to find that that great balance of low risk, high reward for systems that need that. Yeah, and, and you know, I guess as we continue the discussion from from SLA to um, one of the main um, value props of the public cloud, and that's this this rapid innovation cycle. Um, you know, I think some sometimes the tendency is to develop because we've reduced these number of barriers. You know, and and 
procurement is one of the many that, uh, that the public cloud really alleviates in terms of you know getting getting the hardware into your traditional data center. Um, that that traditional process has a bit of lag associated with it, and, and traditionally we've we've you know launched a project. You know, if we're talking about the the context of enterprise IT, for example, we've launched a project. We know we have a certain amount of time before we can even get close to debuting a service or starting work on a service, and that's the time we take, you know, potentially to do some architecture. Well, that's a very different paradigm in, in the public cloud world. Um, and, and what we've seen, certainly what I've seen firsthand, is you know a, a reluctance to do as much upfront planning um, a, a, as maybe is required. So, what is that balance between real rapid innovation, where you've got the idea, you've you've got the business case, um, you're gung ho to get started? But then taking a step back and saying, how do I do this? What are the cloud best practices? You know, how how do I really understand the best way to architect this solution? Where's the balance there, and, and where should you know organizations be, be focusing on? Uh, I, so this is Joe. Um, some some thoughts about that uh, as we've uh, wrestled with some of those issues. Um, I think fundamentally, um, from my perspective. The thing the cloud does is it pushes server development, server uh, architecture, cloud architecture, in let's say either entirely into software development or at least a far distance into software development. So asking the question that you asked is much like asking the question of should I take the time to write a spec for my applications, a thorough functional and technical specification. Uh, should I take the time to make prototypes for my software? Uh, because fundamentally, it's the same issue. You can you can you could go just spew out a bunch of PHP and write a web application pretty quickly. But I think most enterprises have now recognized that that is not a good thing to do. But you're right. A, there are a lot of enterprises who uh, have decided that that uh, archi that systems architecture in the cloud should mirror. A lot of systems architecture on premises on bare metal, which is oh, let's set up the let's launch a bare VM, let's install a bunch of software, configure all the software, and not templatize that, and that's a real mistake. Um, so, I, from my perspective, actually, it, it is much faster and easier and better development now than we ever have had uh, as far as systems architecture. It's a lot faster to do awesome systems architecture on the cloud than it ever was to do mediocre systems architecture. Uh, on premises, so uh, I, I, to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, my I perspective that here is that not even about uh, speed versus planning. Uh, the cloud makes us to plan things and execute things faster. So typically, the traditional things what we used to do months in cloud, we are doing it in weeks. So the whole approach of uh, taking in a project, architecting it. And then coding and implementing it, the whole cycle has become faster. The computing part of the cloud has helped us to use the pre-built APIs, the pre-built services, so which we would manually take uh, uh, weeks to assemble in the traditional model. Uh, the cloud model typically you see abstracts those things, gives those things as APIs, and uh, it has made the whole thing easier for us. So I wouldn't say like speed versus planning, but it has made the entire planning, the entire execution process itself faster. So it, in a sense, it has uh, aided this entire uh, uh, architecture planning and architecture implementation phase itself. So I think the other thing too that's really interesting here is is there's a clear trend in cloud development, um, especially. Uh, in terms of web facing, um, and even to a certain extent, when you have uh, you know big data apps and other things, there's a clear trend towards um, m building much more granular components and assembling those components into a whole. Um, the classic example is Amazon's own website, where um, you know if you go, when was the last time you went to Amazon.com? The page didn't load. That's a bad question these days because there actually was an outage only about three months, two or three months ago, but. Uh, but it's been really, really rare that you've gone to Amazon and a page hasn't loaded. And the reason for that is because each of those components you see on the Amazon homepage is a separate application, a separate service that's being gathered into the page um, through calls that are being made uh, uh, as the page gets built. And if an element isn't readily available, there's failover to backup sources of data. And if they just can't load that service for the data from that service for some reason, they just won't draw that element on the page. And 
the, the key thing about that is that granularization is part of the reason why we can move quicker. So we typically now have development teams, we see a lot more development teams where they're actually managing two or three small applications as opposed to one big behemoth application. And what they're doing is they're working with other teams and working with operations through DevOps models um, and a lot of other you know, different kind of communication forms to begin to build small components that they can upgrade independently, patch independently, that they can um, uh, design independent of the other systems. They can de uh, design to the demand that's being made on those services or those application components. And that model of a smaller, more granular pieces, it's much easier to maintain and troubleshoot a smaller piece at a time. Um, the, there are tr fun troubleshooting issues sometimes with the system as a whole. That's why, again, measurement is critical. You see that not only in terms of uh, financial measurement and, and usage measurement, but you get into things like uh, application performance management and other elements when you look at that. And those things become incredibly critical to be able to see how the pieces work together um, and look for those unusual situations where there, there are sort of chains of events that are causing problems. But to maintain the pureness of the individual element becomes much, much easier. And that's why those cycle times can get really low. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, even, it's even much, much easier than even, say, a power builder application or a visual basic application from the 90s, which were considered, quote, unquote, smaller applications until they built and built and built and built into big, giant behemoth apps. And uh, this isn't happening as much in the cloud. What's happening in the cloud is much more that there are more and more and more components and pieces. And at some point in time, component sprawl will probably be an issue we're talking about. But uh, it's a much easier and, and it's a much easier set of stuff to maintain, and it's much easier to iterate on those small components. Yeah, and and, and what a great tie back into you know our earliest earlier statements around the importance of visibility into your environment, right? As you James, as you suggest, building these these smaller services that tie together really, you know, in my mind, creates the need to be able to see them all, see how they're, see how healthy they are, see how they're performing. It just makes even even a greater case, I think, for that top level. You know, I hate to use the single pane of glass uh, um, analogy, but um, you know, get, getting that top down view of all your services a, as they increase in number, as you suggest, the, the trend kind of looks like it is. Um, you know, having the need to uh, the ability to do that becomes in my mind, is even more paramount. Well, it's really fun when you look at, you know, maintaining cost across all these different teams, sure. projects, the different sure. components that they're creating, right? It, you know, what's, you know, maintaining a billing code against a specific set of stuff, that's a big part of, you know, what, what being able to measure that and, and understand that cost becomes incredibly big. And then to be able to restrict actions that can be taken based on those costs, right, which is something that strategies can do in conjunction with that. Um, being able to say, hey, there are limits to the amount of money that a given project team can spend or that a given, um, uh, that a given uh, component can consume. Right. Um, there's a variety of ways of looking at that. Um, that becomes an incredibly important thing, too, because there's no way that the, that the CFO is going to be able to approve each request for different additional resources. That goes against the self-service model. Uh, so what you really want to see is, is that, that um, you know, bringing, bringing in action and, and control based on what you're measuring. And again, it's feedback loops. It's all about feedback loops, ultimately. Um, so it, it's yep. a big thing. Yeah, and I think what what a great summary for the discussion we've had so far is around you know your, your building blocks of, of being able to take advantage of these super dynamic environments come down to you know configuration and, and, and automation. But with that, of course, and with the you know the trends we've talked about today, um, uh, sort of out of that comes the, the need to have a lot of visibility, not only on a on a day to day. You know, are, are my systems running properly? Or are they consuming? You know, have have I designed them properly? But then, um, you know, as you just suggested on the on the analytic side, um, you know, what kind of performance am I getting from my spend on AWS? What does that look like? Um, how can I affect that positively? Um, you know, I think I think it paints. I think a discussion today paints a very clear indication of how important all these factors are, um, and ultimately, you know, how you continue to to develop for the cloud in a real efficient way. I think I think with that we're going to move here to the to the the Q and A um, side of, of uh, what, we're, what we're doing today, and uh, there's still time to get questions in, so please do use that that question uh, box at the side of your screen there in the Go to Webinar panel, 
if you have a question there, type that in and, and we'll get to it. But we've got a list here already of, of, of submitted questions that we're going to move to. So maybe the first thing I'll throw out there, and this is for anybody, I won't, I won't um, point it in any particular direction, but for the enterprise who's looking to um, you know, kind of get their foot wet with public cloud and they want to run a, a proof of concept, maybe they've identified you know, a service or a handful of services they want to see how they perform there. Um, what are some suggestions on how they get started, um, you know, either technical or, or a higher level? Um, what should they be looking for when they, when they begin that journey? So uh, typically, like uh, in our experience, what we have seen is like uh, enterprises, uh, they get to identify the low-hanging fruits, uh, certain applications which are on the periphery that's not in the uh, mainstay. Uh, they are very, very easy candidates to get into the cloud. A uh, lot of enterprises are taking the new developments as well as the applications which are ending their life cycles. Uh, and specifically which applications which needs like a lot of scale, uh, they are being good candidates uh, for getting into cloud. And we are seeing uh, a lot of traction on that front where enterprises are uh, uh, moving that part into the cloud. Uh, another uh, pattern that I have observed is like uh, the DR where uh, certain enterprises are moving some, some of their workloads into the cloud as in, as part of the cold or the warm DR. And uh, uh, while doing this, typically what I have seen is like uh, the architecture is very, very critical onto the cloud. Like just port clicking an application and uh, putting onto the cloud uh, will not give you a lot of benefits. It will help you to have your application running on cloud, but nothing more else. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be leveraging the full uh, features or the functionality of cloud. So certain times you will have to go with uh, architecting it for the cloud using the scale out rather than the scale up uh, using the APIs of the cloud, uh, APIs of uh, Amazon and the design and finally do a lot of automation. So you do a lot of automation then your application would be stable, your application would be running well you have better visibility, better monitoring, and thereby you can keep your costs also in control. So this is what I've seen in terms of uh, enterprises approaching towards the cloud. So can that be difficult for an enterprise that maybe isn't as cloud savvy as the next and then looking to sort of get on board it or, or, or at least you know, run, run this POC and sort of you know, fi figure out where they stand? Can that be difficult identifying applications that are scale out aware? Because you know, as I think through my history in enterprise IT, typically their their application catalog is very, very mixed. And I would say, you know, it 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 lies on the side of you know the traditional application um, that maybe isn't built you know for, for for scale out in mind. Scale scale up maybe scale out not so much. Um, are the are, are are enterprises who you know, identify an application like that, are, are they setting themselves up for failure or, you know, are there still tactics, are there still ways they can take an application like that and get benefit from, from their first, you know, foray into the public cloud? No, it is absolutely possible. Like, uh, uh, you can do scale up as well as uh, in the cloud. So enterprises, uh, we have seen they are moving on to that aspect as well. And when they're doing, like, there are certain, uh, typical simple aspects that you'll have to take care of if it is an online based application where do you maintain the sessions like how do you handle the caches and uh, whether your uh, database is uh, uh, typically partitioned because you cannot expect to get the uh, same performance of a raw hardware that on a virtualized servers. So there are certain ways like you have to go around uh, do the architecture right in on especially on your database areas on uh, writes and striping and all those things. So the moment they are there, like uh, the application is running fine. So certain enterprises take that approach, just forklift, put it onto the cloud, then understand the intricacies, the constraints, as well as the advantages, then go about re-architecting certain players, certain things in places, and then leverage the portion. So we have seen certain enterprises adopting that strategy as well. So. Great, thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Um, is consistency a problem on the public cloud? So, you know, we hear 
we hear about this notion of, of the noisy neighbor in a multi-tenant environment. Is it is it important to have kind of a baseline of performance established before you do that that migration to the cloud? And and how much of a problem is um, you know is sort of operational cons consistency in the context of uh, of the public cloud? I I think it's a really big problem, um, and uh, uh, I know that Zynga um, in its uh, cloud architecture. Uh, when it launches instances, it will launch a series of instances and performance test them and keep uh, the best performing one. We do uh, the same thing with EBS volumes um, uh, because we we have found from a cost perspective that striping many EBS volumes is much more cost effective than using the uh, IOPS optimized ones. Um, but you you get a lot of variety on the performance of them and. Uh, so you're a lot better off if you launch. I think we usually have four or five in a given uh, RAID zero array, and so we'll launch a bunch, uh, test them, and then just keep the ones we like. And uh, as as I think everyone's been pounding here, if you automate, if you have an, uh, if you have a way of orchestrating workloads, you can automate all of that. So you shouldn't think about, gosh, it's such a pain to right. launch ten EBS lines and test them all. No, no, no. You automate that process. Yeah, you know, one of the things is there's there's a whole market that's beginning to develop around understanding performance from the application down perspective in order to get a handle on on beginning to you know being able to make decisions how to better better use the infrastructure services available from Amazon and others. But you know, in Amazon, it's really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of talk about noisy neighbor. There's been services that they've offered to counter that with the IOPS instances and other things. Um, so you have choices there. And I think there's a there's a there's a big portion of what has to happen that really um, comes into uh, again that feedback loop. What what feedback loop are you going to set up to understand the, the operation of your application? And what are the important things for you to focus on to tune either cost or performance or availability or all three of those? Um, and uh, in the right way, and I think uh, you know there's there's some great uh, uh, one of the great areas I think of, of study that's going on is sort of looking at aggregate data, looking at data not only from your own information, but finding a company who will sort of give you some statistics about what they're seeing across all of their customers, and using that information to make some determinations about what's going on in your part portion of the environment and what you're interacting with. So you can get a sense of noisy neighbors. You can get a sense of other things that if they're they're in fact going on, um, and you know it's you know the companies that are the most agile in cloud usage, the ones that have those horizontally scalable, um, uh, very small component, highly agile applications, they're able to say, hey, you know, if we decide we don't like a situation, we kill the instances where we don't like them, and we start up new ones, and and you know look for better situation out of that. Um, and that's kind of the mentality to get to. Although for the enterprise, I realize that there's, it's, you know, that's that's going to be a multi-step process to get there. There's, there's a, an awful lot of um, of learning that has to happen in the course of that. And I think that that's what we're going to see over the next three, four years is the enterprise making that transition from, from you know, more monolithic, um, assume that the infrastructure works kind of approaches to. Being very flexible to say, okay, you know, if we don't like A, we're going to switch to B, right? And uh, and that's really that takes measurement to understand that there's a problem. Right, and, and we come right back to the the age old challenge. I think, as you as you really eloquently put it, is you know, moving from resiliency in the infrastructure to resiliency in the application. And it sounds like this notion of you know noisy neighbors is is something we just simply have to anticipate and plan for. And and to Joe's point. Being able to architect solutions that, that compensate for that, right? Well, and there are services out there that will guarantee IOPS, but sure. the the thing that you're going to get with that is usually there's a cost differential there that you have to pay attention to, pay attention to, um, or uh, you know there's a uh, there there's a, a question of the efficiency of use of resources if in fact they are making those guarantees. So probably restraining you as much as they're enabling you, right? So um, so from that perspective. Um, there's there's uh, there's trade-offs in every kind of condition of what you want to go after, and the question you know the question is is what are the most choices that you can have, and out of those choices, what are the right ones to make? And that's where that's where 
having really good visibility into running your system is, is more important than pretty much anything else. Absolutely. Except taking action, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the foundation. Okay, well, I, you know, thank you very much to, to our panelists today. I think, I think we're going to conclude there. Those are great concluding thoughts. Um, hopefully this has been informative for, for everybody involved. Um, we're going to wrap here, and I just want to remind you briefly before we do that uh, this is the first in a series of, uh, of uh, similarly themed webinars, and uh, New Rem's in the creation or in the process of, of, of getting the agenda out for the next one, but it'll have to do with, uh, with uh, workload migration, and uh, watch your inboxes for, for news of that coming up. Thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your time.